the true embodiment of death, of that statement will be in our speaker this morning. Metaphysician extraordinaire and the embodiment of love and light, our assistant minister, Reverend Anne Shand. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, Kingston, Jamaica, the control center for streaming of our recorded Sunday messages to all in the virtual world. For the past week, we have listened and embodied the rich messages of the Easter and Passover religious festivals, both symbolic in the demonstration of overcoming for the Christian and Jewish religions. We have learned the principle of overcoming all obstacles by and through our awareness of the indwelling spirit of freedom, truth, love, and wisdom. As we seek to practice the principle of lifting our vibrations through meditation, prayer, or any other spiritual practices, the destination of complete emancipation of all discord of every nature is sure to be our reality. My sharing this morning is entitled, The Virtue of Spiritual Awareness. And it is interwoven with the deepening or expansion of our spiritual attributes as we journey through our life's experiences. Virtue is considered by some to be an old-fashioned word. But this morning, I'm staying true to one aspect of its meaning, that of, by the Oxford Dictionary, a good and desirable personal quality, the quality of living in a state of spiritual awareness. This desirable pursuit of focus, paying deliberate attention, with a firm intention to consciously and constantly experience our life's expression with the view of revealing our spiritual attributes through every avenue of our unfoldment. Simply living from a state of heightened spiritual awareness. Therefore, in every moment, we reveal our true nature, our godness, through the absolutes of life, love, light, power, peace, beauty, and joy. I will share a simple story that explains the concept. It is taken from the book, The Miracle of Mindfulness by Thich Nhat Hanh. He was visited with a small family comprising of a son who was seven years old, a young baby, and the father and the mother. During the visit, he observed that the young boy required constant adult attention. And mention was made of observing the baby at least twice per night to ensure that all was well. The question was posed to the father. And I quote, is family life easier than being a bachelor? No answer. So the question was posed in another way. A lot of people say that if you have a family, you are less lonely and have more security. Is that true? End of quote. The young father nodded his assent to that. And he went on to explain, I have discovered a way to have a lot more time. In the past, I used to look at my time as if it were divided into several parts. One part I reserved for my son another for the mother of my children, another part to assist with baby, and another for housework. Housework. Hmm. The time left over, I considered my own. I would read, write, do research, go for walks. But now 
I try not to divide my time into parts anymore. I consider my time with my son and the mother of my children my own time. When I help my son with his homework, I try to see and find ways of seeing his time as my time. I go through the lesson with him, sharing his presence and finding interesting ways to keep us stimulated. So, so what we what do, we do during, during that time is of interest, of interest to me. The same, the same treatment is used for all areas of my life. The remarkable thing is that I have unlimited time for myself. End of quote. Hmm. The young father is more aware, emotionally engaged, and sharing his spiritual investment of his presence with all members of the family and still do housework. His time now is not divided into segments, but a holistic experience of giving and loving. In other words, all aspects of this young father is integrated fully in the time spent with his son, his baby, their mother, and himself, plus housework. So he has unlimited time, fully involved with all aspects of his life and whatever he's doing. So his experience of family life is completely enriching. His expression of life filled with love opens his awareness of wisdom as he mindfully and powerfully integrates his time with his son, his baby daughter, the mother of his children, housework, his research into a pattern without the experiences of distinction, but one seamless whole, and he has the joy of unlimited time. This is how it works with spiritual awareness. Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of the teaching Science of Mind and Spirit, makes a series of statements I will share. They are from his book, How to Use the Science of Mind, and I quote, it makes little difference what method one pursues in arriving at spiritual realization. The method is the way the road he travels. The des destination is the awareness. He may go through a process of affirmation and denial, but always the process shall tend toward the gaining of an inward realization, a feeling, a sense, an atmosphere of peace, harmony, and protection. I'll repeat that, but always the process shall tend toward the gaining of an inward realization, a feeling, a sense, an atmosphere of peace, harmony, and protection. Dr. Holmes goes on to say, our spiritual awareness is the secret place of the Most High. We should think of our lives as an increasing awareness, an ever-growing consciousness, a never-ceasing progress of individual and collective evolution. There should be a constant joy in expansion, an enthusiastic sense of adventure in the progressive unfoldment of spiritual awareness, end of quote. Full integration or immersion of mind, body, and spirit in all aspects of our life's expression. The virtue of mindfulness threaded into every simple task must lead to the enrichment of our lives unfolding into better expressions of our attributes of spirit. To live that pattern now becomes a habit, a behavior, a manifestation of beauty, joy, peace, power, light, wisdom, love, and life. It takes constant practice. One may ask, if we fall off the wagon, what happens? The Bible story of the road to Emmaus, one of the events which took place after the resurrection, gives us ideas to work with. The story is told in St. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 32. But before the story began, Mary Magdalene 
and the other women had seen Jesus the Christ. They shared the good news with the rest of disciples who had described their story as, and I quote, idle tales, and they believed them not, end of quote. So I'll go on to the story about the road to Emmaus. At verse 13, two of the disciples went on the way to Emmaus, some distance away from Jerusalem. As they walked, they spoke of the happenings of the days gone past. It came to pass, as they reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But they did not recognize him at that point. He said to them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, by the name of Cleopas, responded, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people. And they told Jesus all the happenings surrounding the crucifixion, up to the point where the women were told by angels that Jesus was alive. And certain of the disciples, plus women, went back to the tomb and found it empty. Jesus said unto them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? He went on to expound unto them all the scriptures relating to himself. When they got to Emmaus, he asked, they asked him to stay with them. When they sat down to meet, he took the bread and blessed it, break it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. End of story. Imagine walking, talking, eating with the Christ and not being aware of his presence. It sometimes reminds me of myself into the being and the doing and forgetting that the consciousness of the Christ is within until my eyes are open. Verse 32, and I quote, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within, within us while he talked with us? By the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures, end of quote, they went and shared the news. The significance of the heart burn, the stirring into the presence of the Christ as they surrendered, the awareness of the presence opened into their beings the breaking of the bread, feeding of consciousness. But let me not get ahead of myself. Metaphysically, MOS means, this meaning is taken from the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary written by Charles Fillmore of Unity. The meaning is a place in consciousness where the healing, restoring love and life and the truth of spirit spring up and flow freely through man's being. Breaking up bread, the stirring into action of consciousness, of the inner substance of spirit. Spirit is, signifies bread, and the concentrating of mind upon it as the real possession. End of quote. Yes, we already possess that inner substance of spirit. The beauty of the experience when Jesus the Christ chose to remind those disciples of the truth opening their eyes to the resurrection of life, the transition from sadness and anxiety to one of hope and joy, from separation to that place in consciousness where the healing, restoring love and life, the truth of spirit, the Christ flowed freely into their being. The staring into action of the presence of spirit, removing doubt, fear of the unknown, to the certainty and conviction that Christ has risen and very much springing forth in their conscious awareness of his presence in their being. What good news to share with the other disciples. 
this is a message just for us. Yes, we fall off the wagon into the face of sadness, anxiety, fear of the unknown, but the spiritual awareness of our being from the secret place of the Most High fill our minds with inspired thoughts, ideas, which flow forth into our conscious awareness, filling us with bright hope for tomorrow. This happens as we step by step deepen our realization of the presence of God as the principle by which we live our day-to-day -day journey of unfoldment. We consciously do this to enable us to integrate into what we do each day with the quality of the allness and oneness of spirit, mind, and body. So as we mindfully involve all aspects of our being in the task of each day, letting the blessing and inspiration feed our minds, then our body of affairs reflect that consciousness of good into our hands and feet. In the words of Teresa of Avila, Catholic mystic, and I share, Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which is to look out, Christ's compassion to the world. Yours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. Yours are hands with which he is to bless men now, end of quote. Our eyes, hands, feet, and body are instruments of our spiritual awareness. Therefore, as we seek to perfect our realization of this way of being as a virtue, then the benefits must bless all mankind. Remember Philippians 4, verse 8, and I quote, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things, end of quote. All these states of mind, honesty, being just, of pure intent, lovely, of good report, are already part of our natural expression. Let us be increasingly aware by seasoning our thoughts, words, and actions with one attribute or combination of all. When we pre prepare ourselves daily, to enter into the expression of life. Let us be passionate, enthusiastic, and with joy, do and be our spiritual work. If our prayer is one of peace and harmony, then we express that consciousness in every avenue of our interaction and engagement with the world. One member of our congregation took this matter seriously. When exercising the prayer of the Christ our Father, or Psalm 23, is replayed in the forefront of the consciousness of our own mind. Her spirit feeds her mind with divine substance, the word, whose energy now flows through her nervous system. She's strengthened during the process, protected by the vibrations of love that flow from her. Her very presence is a blessing, individually and collectively, as all who come into contact with her are uplifted. This increases spiritual awareness, which flows into ever-growing, expanding consciousness of all. So when we meditate, we can do that through exercise. We refine and release aberrations from our nervous system. Then what out pictures as balance, calmness of spirit, and harmony flows through the body temple, and we reflect that. Therefore, with that state of mind, when on the road, or at our place of work, or any other engagement, our decisions flow from a sound, stable mind. We observe without judgment, and truly love and forgiveness are displayed. The use of spiritual uplifting literature is also another spiritual practice. It assists us in the expansion of consciousness as well. As we read, slowly going over or repeating the concepts in mind, 
probably internalizing them, studying them, 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 then the very, the very essence, essence of the subject is raised in quotations, open, open my minds and hearts. From there, there will, will be in joy, in joy and, and, and enthusiasm. The subtle messages are stored within our memory banks, and when the challenges flare up, a message flow from the memory to dissolve and replace what we do not want. We embrace the truth of our being, and guess what? The universe now ensures that all the experiences of the day carry the fragrance of what was internalized and revealed. How many times we have read and affirmed something we have seen, and everywhere we go for that day, parts of the affirmation show up from persons, places, or things. We expand our consciousness when we remain God-centered, God-aware in the midst of all meetings, engagements, and activities, God meeting God in every conference. And where God is, there is peace and harmony, good for all concerned, which must outpicture as success and well-being. We also learn from every interaction, acquire skills and information that enhance growth and unfoldment. The individual benefits are breathtaking, not to mention the indirect benefits to family, friends, and our earth plane. So when we evolve in a God-centered direction, abiding constantly in that state, whether or not we are consciously aware, something happens. If for some reason a picture of pain, hurt, come before us, we are the channel of healing since we observe the scenario. It is now the opportunity to see things rightly, knowing that the reality of love and truth flow forth as it is one mind. Something must happen. We do not have to know the step-by-step -step demonstration but we must use our tools appropriately to ensure that the loving kindness and the goodness of spirit is revealed in the midst of the pictures or images that come before us from time to time. We are the source of healing. Dr. Ernest Hobbes, the founder of our teaching, Science of Mind and Spirit, in his book, The Science of Mind, reminds us, and I quote, we should daily train our thought to recognize the spirit in everything we do, say, or think. Our treatment is an action in thought alone. It opens the avenues of thought, expands the consciousness, and lets reality through. It clarifies the mentality, removes the obstruction of thought, and lets in the light, end of quote. So when we speak our word through our treatment for all the world, we know what happens. The presence of God is now released and revealed. Healing of conditions must take place. So let us not be weary of well thinking. This is the way for collective evolution for the good of all concerned. So after the days appears and we are about to sleep, let us meditate on and contemplate the awareness of the presence of God as us, in us, and let that state of mind bless our world. Let us affirm together, I think a kind thought for all the world, and all the world is happy and blessed. I repeat that. I think a kind thought for all the world, and all the world is happy and blessed. What a blessing to the entire earth plane. We think a kind thought for all the world, and we know that all the world is happy and blessed. So let us summarize the virtue of spiritual awareness. We cannot traverse life filled with sadness, anxiety, and fear of the unknown when the silent presence of the spirit of love, life, and joy is within to provide comfort, spontaneous right action to bless our lives. All we have to do is remember 
and call it forth. Just as Jesus the Christ in that beautiful moment reminded the two disciples that they are not alone. But the Christ consciousness is always there to feed their minds, integrating all aspects of their being. As they became more aware and surrendered, oh, did they not say? They felt the flame of love burn in their hearts. The young man at the beginning of my talk, let us follow his example. Jump into life. Giving of our time, interest, and passion to everything we place our eyes and hands on. Let our feet dance a rhythm of oneness and joy of being a channel through which universal love blesses all creation. So in everything we do, we let that spiritual awareness thread through the full realization of our godness, showing up in all activities we are involved in. We are enthusiastic and a sanctuary of blessing, a joy to God. We live in a constant state of gratitude and non-judgment. And we let that perfect spirit perfect all that concerns us. I leave you with, I behold the Christ in all. I glory in your perfection and wholeness. Namaste.